You're listening to the Barcode Podcast with your host, Chris Glandon, serving cybersecurity straight up with no chaser. Let's hit the bar and grab a drink. <laughs> Woo! Turn the fans on. Hey, Chris. Oh, hey, Tony. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You could have warned me first. What's up with the mankini? Oh, snap. Yeah, man. You know, the weather's getting nice. Got the windows open. Got to get my tan on. Got to look good, bro. Got to keep bringing in the customers. You know what I'm saying? You sure you're not scaring them away? I mean, fluorescent yellow is your color, though. Oh, hell yeah. So what you drinking? Man, I'm feeling something very specific tonight. I'm looking for a single malt scotch whiskey with an ABV parameter of 43 to 49.5%, with the nose being a vanilla and orange medley, followed by a palate that introduces notes of caramel and apple. Oh, and no less than 80 proof, but only if you got that handy. Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold up there, Einstein. You know I'm not very technical. Could you explain that in layman's terms for me? Man, just give me something close to it. All right, I got you. Just give me uh, just give me a second here. It's what we call the carnivore. In an old-fashioned glass containing just a few ice cubes, you combine one ounce of scotch whiskey, five ounces of club soda, dash of lemon juice, stir it, put a little garnish of lemon slice on top. Close enough. Oh, my man just walked in. This guy's a DevSecOps guru with a true entrepreneurial spirit. I'm out. Nice. All right, man. We'll see you next round. Nate O'Reilly takes what others know to be true and is still able to find something hidden below the surface. It's a mind frame that proves being invisible does not equal being impossible. Therefore, I'm honored to be here with the man capable of true X-ray vision, a security researcher, DevOps guru, and an expert content creator, Nate O'Reilly. What's up, brother? Thanks for having me on, Chris. Yeah, looking forward to this convo. Um, I can't kick this off properly without hearing your backstory. Talk to me a bit about your background and what spawned your interest in cybersecurity. So my background is a little less conventional than what most people generally, I guess, hear from folks in my space. So I, I started off just having a general interest, like I was very much so a hobbyist. So anyone who's watching my YouTube channel, there's a video where I talked about how I first started learning uh, ethical hacking by accident as a kid with a Dreamcast. <laughs> nice. <laughs> because, I, you know, Dreamcast, believe it or not, it has Windows CE on it, which when I was a kid, I didn't know what that meant. I was just like, I want to play Fantasy Star Online. And it had a dial up modem on it. And I didn't have dial up minutes. So what I would do is I would use the Dreamcast to to get other people's dial up minutes so I could play Fantasy Star Online. And I was just like, oh, sweet, you can play you can play this game for free and you don't have to pay for some one of these dial up services. And it's like kids don't have access to credit cards and stuff. I was a little kid. So (laughs) that's kind of where a lot of things started was just wanting to tinker with games uh, and wanting to, to mod things. And so years go on. Really, what got me started was I was trying to go to college to be a public speaker, and that didn't really go out how I had planned. And at one point, I broke my hips and I had this job working at a conference center and I was supposed to, you know, go and be walking around, helping people be on stage, do stuff like that. But now I'm just like, well, I can't walk around on stage or anything like that. So I need to go get like a a desk job. So I, I got this job selling cell phones at a place that also worked on city networks. And at that place, uh, long story short, I ended up getting roped into working on malware (laughs) is what I spent most of my time on. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then it was it was the only real technology business in the region. And so I I got this really wide range of experience, which is included. You know, it was in a remote region out in the mountains. And so I learned how to do satellite technology. And so I started working heavily with satellite technology, which was sort of my first introduction into networking, which is kind of different from other people. They probably learned networking from other things. Mine's like, oh, how do you uh, give people access to things in, in regions that no one knows how to get to, knows how to get networking to, that there's no like 
people use solar arrays for their power out in some of these places. Then also some other things I was doing at that time were just like refurbishing computers for these folks as well and, and repairing people's computers. So all of these experiences gave me a good idea of how computers work. And if you were to ask me back then if, if I was going to work in computers at the time, I even told the people that I wasn't going to help them with the computer stuff because they said, hey, do you want to do these things? I was like, no. And then really the Verizon contract, because I was selling Verizon cell phones ended. They're like, well, you can either go do something else or you can work on computers. And I was like, well, fine. So after I left that job, I actually went back to trying to get back into public speaking. And then once again, it just didn't work out for me. And, you know, I got a, a job opportunity to start working at this company where they worked on cloud technology and they're creating their own cloud from ground up. And that was my first real introduction into compliance and into really cybersecurity, because then I started working more heavily with regulations and compliance and making sure that companies are meeting regulation and disaster recovery. And then at that time, we had clients who would have incidents where like their home is on fire, their business is on fire, or then there was a flood in the region. So then it's like people's servers are underwater and you're trying to see like, mm. can we save this business? And sometimes you just couldn't. It's like, okay, so there's a flood. Oh, well, I, well, there goes half the businesses. So I kind of came up in my career from like helping businesses with disasters, uh, doing forensics with like legal work. Cause a lot of their customers were also like law offices. Uh, and then that got the attention of logarithm who came to me. Uh, and then, you know, ultimately after I went to logarithm, then that led to me starting my own thing, which then led to me working at Blue Mira, which then Blue Mira is kind of like a cross between things I learned at Logarithm and things I learned in Cloudland, because now it's like cloud and security really need to come together. And so now I have this big focus on uh, and then, you know, I, I, I do other business ventures and stuff like that nowadays. But now I'm really focused on it. Where, where does security and cloud collide? Because that's a big deal these days. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you can't avoid cloud anymore. It's pretty much everywhere you go. So you're an integrations engineer at Blue Mirror. Is that correct? That's right. I do integrations engineering at Blue Mirror. So that's the full time thing that I just how can we come up with new things that will do new things and then make make people secure with it? <laughs> nice. And you have uh, we kind of talked about this offline a little bit, but you have sort of a hobbyist background and engineering background. I did read that you were creating your own SIM at one point, just off of Raspberry Pi 4. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm I actually also very much so a serial entrepreneur. And so one of the things that I spent a lot of time doing just on my own time is working at all these different types of companies you inevitably pick up skills. And then if you're doing things, you kind of find things that you like. And I found that I have like this odd obsession with just SIM technology. And so it was after basically having this hacking tournament for students wanting to learn real world hacking. So I was like, I know we can just like get some systems and all of you can learn hacking ethically by consensually hacking each other. It just makes sense. And uh, this was at a time when this new platform called the Raspberry Pi 4 came out for those who might not have heard of a Raspberry Pi. But all of a sudden, this tiny little machine, this tiny little Raspberry Pi had the amount of power in it that you would see in like enterprise grade systems, because a lot of enterprise grade systems, people go and they get these data centers with like hundreds or thousands of servers. And then trying to upgrade all of those is a nightmare. So usually if they go and get some systems, they're going to keep the same old systems that they've had for as long as they can. And those systems at a lot of places are about as powerful as a Raspberry Pi 4. <laughs> and so I'm sitting here looking at this little teeny tiny thing that's like smaller than my head. I'm like, I can have the power of the enterprise on my desk. And there was something captivating about that. Cause then since I, you know, I build SIM technologies, I was like, I bet you can make a tiny SIM out of this. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Yeah. So uh, that's exactly what I did. And I created a platform called the Olympiad, which is something that <laughs> is just, it's, I guess, more or less my platform that I'll be releasing open source, but I've been working on this thing for years at this point. Um, but really, I guess the Olympiad, it's a tiny little cloud development system with just SIM built into it. 
Uh, and it did start off as me building a sim. I was like, oh, sweet. I can just like build a sim for my own home. So I just started building one. I didn't know if it was going to turn into a product. I didn't know if I was going to sell it. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I, I did actually get investors coming around and asking if, if, if I was going to do anything with that. I was like, no, I just want this platform. Like I, I want something that's mine that I can work on that I'm not going to sell that I can just build with. And then that's why I was like, you know, I, I, if I'm going to go and, and have some fancy platform, I'll go work on someone else's uh, really big one. So, I, you know, I have this big interest in uh, open source and keeping things open source and making things more widely available that help like those around me and help people's careers. So I'm like, well, if I take this thing I made. One of the challenges I had is I used to teach sim and teaching sim is so expensive that most institutions are, are like, well, we can't afford the stuff that lets us teach sim without it being a nightmare. And so I was like, well, why don't we just solve that problem instantly by here? Here's a sim. Anyone can use it. Now, of course, people have to know how to use it. And so maybe it's not viable for business, but for like educators or developers who have their own home security or people who are like security enthusiasts or learners or anyone who falls under that category. Uh, that's really what I built it for. Uh, and so, you know, if a business wants SIM, that's another story. It makes sense to go look at something that's more business ready. But for someone who's trying to learn or trying to protect their home or protect their family members home remotely, all kinds of stuff, or just start a small business and stuff like that. Uh, it's a, it's a platform that's designed for engineering cloud products and solutions with SIM built into it. Because if you have SIM built into it, then you can protect those solutions that you created on top of also releasing them and doing whatever you want with them. So you can have everything in one tiny little box on your desk. So anyways, I, I get really, uh, I guess, obsessed in a lot of ways of seeing like, how can you make the smallest thing do the most. And I, I don't think that's something that's ever going to leave me. <laughs> it's inexpensive too, right? So you can really continue to build this out. It's not going to cost the consumer much money at all besides, you know, the Raspberry Pi and then the open source software. And just for them to have hands-on practical experience uh, with it, I think that um, I think that's great. And, and there's not many SIM technologies out there that allow you to do that. It's true. And then, you know, one of the other things is because I work in the SIM space, if I'm constantly trying to help SIM companies and trying to help SIM companies grow, and right now it's like, I want SIM company I work with to have things that are going to work out. It's like, it's really hard to ensure that there are ways for people outside of this tiny niche market to even know how any of these things work. And so then it, it makes it also really it creates challenges in the market where all these companies who have these technologies that we should know and that we should be able to get people who can do these things to help keep society safe. Cause you know, that's how we prevent things like I'm not trying to rag too hard on, on solar winds, but that's how we prevent these things from happening is making things that are otherwise like borderline impossible to learn. Well, otherwise the only way to learn it is to hope you get lucky enough to get one of these kinds of jobs doing the stuff. And then if you're that lucky, then if you start doing it, then that means that anyone working in the space, if you're not someone who's been doing it for like one of the very few people who've been doing it for years, then that means it's an entire market of people who don't really understand how it all works. And then, and then the whole SIM market sees it. It's not just one SIM company that sees it. It's not just, and then every single SIM customer sees it. And, and that's a very stressful situation because if anyone doesn't know what that technology is, it's like the macro of monitoring. It's like monitoring, not just one technology, not just three technologies, not just a hundred, like 5,000. <laughs> yeah. I mean, every technology, how can we monitor everything in a way that also allows for privacy, which is also another big challenge that comes with that. And then you have an, a scenario where if people don't have a way to learn this stuff at home or learn this stuff before trying to get these jobs, that puts privacy at risk too. Because think about the power, like giving that kind of power to people who don't know what's going on when it's not necessarily their fault. You can't go to college to learn this stuff efficiently. And it's, and so it's, in my opinion, just, just no. put it in people's homes. Yeah, you make a great point. Put it in people's homes. Put it in the classroom, put it, you know, where folks don't have a sim at arm's reach. That way, you know, hopefully aspiring professionals will enter the field with a sense of its capabilities by getting that hands on experience. So, yeah, please keep us informed on how that project progresses. Is there a GitHub link or how can our listeners check it out? The, the 
probably the best place to get access to it right now because there's going to be a full open source release of it later on. But right now, the best way to get started with it is to go check out cloudunderground.dev. And at that website, that's just basically where we will be hosting uh, all of our official packaging when, when that's all ready. Meanwhile, there is a white paper that will be available that people can kind of start learning with. So if you're trying to learn or you're trying to build some lessons, uh, you know, we're going to have some lessons available. And then otherwise, my YouTube channel does have some lessons, uh, you know, with it, including, you know, how can you learn with the white paper? So a lot of that's also on my YouTube channel. Uh, so there are a lot of ways to, to start learning. And then you and then you can go get any cybersecurity job because you can learn so much at home. You, you don't even have to have a job to actually learn the things that the employers need. Yeah, very true. No, I'm looking forward to it, man. So let's get into DevSecOps for a moment, if you don't mind. I vividly remember back in the day, and I'm sure you remember too, when securing code was non-existent. And then there was a time when it was an afterthought. And now the DevSecOps movement has really taken off and has become a priority in many organizations embedding security processes within the SDLC. I'm curious to get your take on the current state of DevSecOps. Generally speaking, do you feel comfortable with where it is today? And if not, what are some of the missing factors you find are needed to get DevSecOps running at full speed? So DevSecOps, I feel like in a lot of ways, DevSecOps is something that's so new that a lot of companies who aren't, especially if it's not a new company. So any established company is going to run into this challenge where they have existing infrastructure, existing practices, and trying to uproot whatever a company is already doing or already has is, is well, pretty much a nightmare, just to be blunt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, with the idea of DevSecOps, one of the challenges with DevSecOps is if you want to have like security in your development process without it taking up a tremendous amount of time, uh, it, in a lot of ways, you have to have workflows set up and understand what those workflows are and what they mean. And so I guess in terms of how are how's the market going to handle DevSecOps and how are they handling it right now? I would say it's it's definitely still an immature concept. DevOps in general is is a concept that's been out there for some time because DevOps is you know the philosophy around development and operations all, and all of that. But when we get to the security aspect of it, oftentimes security can mean you know, slowing down development processes, which can stifle cash flow. And then for people who don't understand the development side of it, that can be anxiety inducing, which can result in budgets not going into the security aspect of the development. And they're like, well, that costs more time, which costs more money. And so then that anxiety is something that permeates the industry right now. And so I think in a lot of ways, helping people understand that secure development doesn't mean that it, you know, it requires more time necessarily. A lot of it goes down to what's the ROI of educating your developers. And I think that discussion helps people understand. So, okay, so what if there is a time sink into figuring out the security aspect of it? Well, the more you decide to say, okay, well, if, if, if we have this concern about time and we're going to have to figure that out with budget, if you don't have security, eventually you're going to have some breach that's going to take up all your time. And that's also a reality. <laughs> so you can either deal with the breach, which is going to take up more time, be a bigger disaster, going to cause some PR stuff and some other things. Uh, or ideally, you can set up everything that you're doing with a posture that makes you feel more confident to know that while things might take a little more time up front, you have sort of like this structure that as you go and you get more customers and you get all these things, you have fewer disasters to recover from and re having to recover from disasters is inevitable. My, my career is very heavily rooted in disaster recovery from 2008, dealing with like malware, watching businesses in the recession, going out of business, literally repossessing people's offices, people like crying on the step of their office door while I'm like wheeling their stuff out of their office. <laughs> like, <laughs> like you'll feel bad about that sort of thing. You're like, how do you prevent these disasters from happening all the time? And it starts with everything you do in the beginning of your business. And, you know, it, businesses who want to think about 
how to prevent the worst case scenario, like before those scenarios happen, I guess it comes down to like risk analysis. And hopefully I'm not getting like too off into the weeds or. (laughs) No, I mean, I think it all comes down to the priority, right? So companies or organizations just have to prioritize it correctly. I I think that more people are going in the right direction, right? But Mm -hmm. there's things that are happening on the side. Like let's take COVID, for example. How did COVID and the pandemic affect these workflows that were put in place when, you know, DevSecOps was really starting to accelerate? I think that's a huge question because, you know, what immediately comes to mind is video conferencing. Uh, And there is the whole thing about like Zoom bombing that started coming up like in, in 2020 where people were talking about like, oh, no, people are Zoom bombing where they're just dropping into your your Zoom conversations and your Zoom meetings and all this stuff. And, you know, it's easy to think that DevSecOps might only apply to like the most complicated, like, oh, yeah, we're writing code. We know how to do really complicated data science and AI. And, it, and I think sometimes when people think DevSecOps like really just applies to whatever that is. But if you're running a business where you have routine meetings and especially if you're doing like content that's going out in the air and getting recorded and things like that, that's part of your operations. And so if we're talking about DevSecOps, then what that means is that your Zoom meetings are part of your ops. And if you're trying to schedule for a meeting and try to get everyone to show up at the same time, that's a development process. So if you're just trying to get a meeting for people to show up on time to host a podcast, that's dev. And then if once you're doing the podcast, that's ops. And then in the context of like Zoom bombing and people jump, jumping into Google meetings and all this stuff, the idea of just adding a password to your Zoom meetings or the idea of just adding, maybe setting up like an approved attendee list or something like that, that's adding the security part. And that would be the dev sec ops. And that would give, give everyone something that's a little more tangible and relatable because nowadays, if you do business online, you've probably had to touch zoom, whether you've liked to touch zoom or not, maybe you've dealt with zoom bombing, maybe you haven't, but if you add passwords to your zoom meetings for, especially if it's for business operations, then that's dev sec ops. And so I do think that like companies like zoom, you know, instead of, trying to do what we see some companies do where they try to blame like their intern when things go wrong, be like, it was the intern. We don't need to do that. But uh, (laughs) like Zoom for better or for worse is just like, you know what, we're going to try to talk about it. We're going to try to talk about security. We're going to get the topic out there and we're going to, and we're going to talk about, you know, what might make Zoom meetings more secure since it's happening to our own company. And I think a lot of them just going out there and talking about putting passwords on your Zoom meetings, that's the sort of thing that pushes DevSecOps into the mass market to where it becomes something that everyone becomes a little more minded of. But I think that's something that comes from the responsibility of the the companies who are developing the apps, where there has to be a culture at the company where someone has someone at Zoom had to say that, I think it's a good idea for us to address this in this way. Versus just being like, well, you know, they they could have come up with a a million and a half different kinds of responses that were not about trying to be more secure. They could have tried to blame users and say that you're using it wrong. And that, you know, and the leadership of a company has a massive part to play in the culture, not only at a company with their own internal developers, but then the user base who's using their application that they then serve. People who routinely set up Zoom meetings are developers. Whether or not people want to think of them as developers, that's development. And so I think it's important to think about like anytime you're creating something or anything that someone else might be able to get access to, the question is, is this something that where privacy matters? And if if privacy doesn't matter, I guess that's a whole nother story. Because if you're talking about like government Zoom meetings where they have to host certain public government meetings and anyone can join Well, that wouldn't be a zoom bombing. That'd just be some jerk coming in and being, you know, saying yeah. things in the middle of a meeting. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, that's a very, very interesting perspective. You know, what you're saying is 
DevSecOps doesn't need to be restricted to the SDLC. You're saying it reaches far beyond that. I believe so. I think that it's something that anyone who, who does any form of anything on the internet that they serve, I think that they should be mindful of, of you know, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So we were talking about COVID and, and the state of DevSecOps right now. As this practice evolves, and I know this may be difficult to answer right now, but how do you see DevSecOps taking shape in tomorrow's world? Do you see more automation coming into play? Do you see more AI coming into play? You know, what do you think the future of secure development will look like? I do think that there's no getting away from AI. <laughs> <laughs> I it's do see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and for better or for worse, we'll see what that looks like. And then from the standpoint of automation, automation is an interesting thing where it can either help make things more secure or it can be part of the breakdown of security. And I do think that in a lot of ways, like what's going to help companies have more mature DevSecOps and how's that going to play as the future moves along here is I do think we're going to see more automation because a lot of the things that help us be secure or stay secure, uh, if you give people options on how to access something, then what you'll notice is that you'll get the range of people accessing whatever said thing is in any way possible. Uh, not even necessarily on purpose. People will get confused trying to figure out like, you know, how to access something. So I guess if, if we were to uh, kind of uproot the idea and, and take a look at like physical security, because cybersecurity is based on physical security too. And we think about like automation. If we think about like the essence of automation, if you go to an airport, around the world and because airports are one of those things that's tangible enough to where anyone anywhere has, has probably at least heard of an, an airport and if you go to an airport then you know they have lines and lanes and alleys and what they do is they they reduce uh your options your for for entry points they reduce your entry points uh automation makes it easier to reduce entry points and then change whatever those entry points are i don't know if that makes any sense but like systems have have entry points if you're accessing a website to go to a, a website's class let's say that you're going to udemy.com or something like that and you want to go on there and log into your profile it's like the first thing you have to do if udemy.com is like the building then you have to figure out like where the front door of the building is. And so then they have like their login button. And so then automation means that somewhere in between that login, because that login is a single point of access. That's where you have decisions for how can you manage automation around at least the gatekeeping and then other things that maybe we automate. How do we monitor the gate next? You know, and, and we do the same things on the Internet that we do with real buildings like a building. We're like, well, how about we add some cameras? OK, great. How about we add some motion sensors with the Internet? We do the same thing. We're like, how about we add some monitors? How about we add some tracking? How about we add, you know, and then we sit there and try to figure out what, what can we do to measure uh, the things that might make those who are trying to enjoy themselves within our business space feel safe and, and be safe so that, you know, you come work with us. You don't have to worry about something unexpected that's going to then cause you to go away. And simplifying existing workflows, right? Yeah. And, you know, with that, do you see the human element ever disappearing? If, if one day we are just controlled by robots, one day we might get to the point where we get you know, more decision fatigue than machines do. And that's inevitable. And, and if anyone's never heard of decision fatigue, Google it and then go look at the scientific articles, not just the Google articles, because you get different results because people say some random things on blogs. But if you actually actually <laughs> read about decision fatigue, human beings can only make so many decisions in a day. And if you uh, find individuals and you start like go to a group and just tell them what to do on average, most people will gravitate to others making decisions for them. And if we create machines that make decisions for us, then inevitably we're going to get a large section of the population that just does whatever the machines tell us to do. And, and then the question is, is that controllable? What do you do at that junction? If something like that, ha as a developer, we have to figure these things out. Maybe other people don't have to figure out that puzzle, but it's like, if people are just going to do what they're told, how can we avoid basically like a machine just telling everyone what to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, uh, I, I get it, man. And 
I guess that brings me to my, my next topic and that's people versus machines. And it sounds like a, a futuristic UFC pay-per-view <laughs> humans still exist. And when humans operate or program software that that software runs on machines, does that make the machines as vulnerable as the humans? It's an interesting question. Cause on one end, if you try, depending on what you try to do with AI, if you, if you take AI and you put it on a machine and you try to design the AI to try to protect a system from like intrusion, if there's enough people who are coming in and out of an environment, the AI will usually conclude that what makes the most sense is to just start locking users out entirely. And until it just concludes that user access is a volatile thing. And then that might be the, the thing that will keep the ecosystem most secure is to keep people away from it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and then of course, people are going to try to, you know, fight anything that seems interesting so people versus machines, if we don't, if we don't think about safeguards, AI does introduce this possibility where we are going to end up having machines fighting us if we don't design things in a way that keeps that in mind. True. <laughs> and it's funny to me that we see all these movies and stuff like that. But the, the interesting thing is we're closer to, to certain realities than I think some people realize, because if something's just programmed to do what it, whatever it's supposed to do. Right now, we don't have this threat of something that's going to generally successfully reproduce itself at scale. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with us trying to constantly reproduce anything at scale, we're going to start trying to create something that can reproduce itself at scale. That's then that's just inevitable. So when that happens, then, you know, it, it, it is going to be how, how I do want to know how are we going to handle that as a, as a global situation because technology is a global thing and that's that's another thing is we we generally haven't had too many general threats in the world that aren't sanctioned to a particular region outside of something like a pandemic usually things are very regional because of like language limitations and other things but in the context of ai that's something that's going to be more universal where languages are used universally and with code binary is binary and so it doesn't matter if the AI doesn't speak someone else's language when trying to go and, and figure out what's going on with another environment or something. So anyways, I don't know. I think about stuff like that because because if you do spend enough time with AI, it, if, if it is designed for security purposes, it, it will generally start to fight you at some point. A hundred percent. And how about that code that goes into Tesla's or those Uber self-driving cars or manufacturing machinery where you know, the margin of error or the exposure level of vulnerabilities is, is extremely important. And that's not, you know, regionalized or, or centralized to one area either. That's going to be for the masses. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the DevSecOps process or, or flow there, I would think needs to be scrutinized and, and regulated to a point where you're putting killing machines on the road. Yeah. Cause I mean, car accidents are one of the leading causes of death period. Mm -hmm. And so if we take just that fact into, you know, account, and then we have maps and Google maps and things like that, that systems can now use and contextualize when we do start implementing stuff into like self-driving cars and things of that nature, what's to say that if something doesn't get infected or have some force or form of like corruption or some form of vulnerability or something along those lines, because you're right. It's different when there aren't lives at stake, when we're talking about developing things and you just get like locked out of a system or maybe it decides to make some random decision, or maybe it gets uh, hacked by someone malicious for various reasons. Cause people do that. Uh, it is a dangerous territory because the more we uh, like autonomize vehicles and things like that, we do run into the scenario where not only do we have to deal with, you know, what's going on with the growth of like self-driving technologies, all these other things, but what about volatile people with negative self-interests uh, who might try to, you know, essentially do what they do is just influence technologies to do something that's going to be rather malicious. And, and that could cause, uh, you know, safe, like public safety issues and national defense concerns. And so I guess in terms of DevSecOps and things like that, when we do have these foundations that change, this, this is a tricky one because if you don't want to have waste, we don't necessarily want to mass produce. But if we don't frequently change our hardware, then the longer 
a piece of hardware is out there without certain forms of like updates and patches and things like that. So like cars, for example, if someone gets a car, there are people out there still driving cars from the nineties and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. There are people driving cars from the seventies and eighties, but what if someone's driving a self-driving car that's 20 years old using heavily vulnerable computing technologies that don't have a way to update and be maintained. And normally when we're not talking about in the context of cars and things like that, that are sort of more independent. And we're talking about like a, a data center, a data center is always plugged in data center. If someone needs to update something for a security threat, great. Facebook lives on centralized ecosystems. And if Facebook wants to go make changes to their environment for security stuff or LinkedIn or YouTube doesn't really matter which one, some platform that has data centers and maybe they just want to like add patches to, to mitigate a security breach or, or threat with cars. You can't do that. You could, you could try to do uh, what they do with brakes where they try to do like a callback. But then once again, it's up to the drivers to notice it or pay attention to it or go and put forth the effort. And so it, it, it does create an awkward situation that that does make society maybe a little more vulnerable than I think a lot of people might realize. And in the context of like Tesla, they have a lot more operational budget to do certain things and engineers with certain levels of interest in maintaining DevSecOps and security. So they'll have a culture around that. But when other companies start to copy a company, this is where you start to get another breakdown in development where someone starts something, whoever started said thing generally puts a level of detail and attention to it. That's different because a lot of their market interest is that they came from being the first to something and their goal is to be, you know, as advanced in the market as they can and, and stay that way. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about Honda and we're talking about Toyota and standard line vehicles that where people are going to be like, what's selling? Okay. Can we copy that? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All of a sudden, that's when safeguards aren't taken into account and other things. And people are trying to just, you know, mass produce to try to just get a quick release. And, you know, when you work in quick release culture, because I work in quick release culture. Well, if, if you work in startup land in general, if you don't know how to do quick releases, you're, you're probably just going to go out of business so fast that you won't know what to do. And so quick release is, is still a thing with, with cars and other technologies like that too, where they're like, just get it out, just get it out. And you know, while people do care about their work, it's not to say that human error is going to probably result in some heavy impacts in that general space. <laughs> and I do worry about some of these things because it, it really comes down to, you know, what's the culture of those getting into some of these things. And a lot of folks don't particularly well, you, you get folks saying that cybersecurity that it isn't real or that it's a myth or that it's the new snake oil salesman. And then they'll have weird things happen to them and they'll wonder why. And they'll be like, oh, I have this crazy problem. And it's like, yeah, but cybersecurity doesn't exist to this person. And so if we as long as we have people who aren't part of understanding that cybersecurity is something that we can have as a culture and really that it should be something that is everyone's responsibility until we start to kind of get in a mind space, I think as a society that cybersecurity is, is very much so everyone's responsibility. Even if you're an educator at a school, well, you have a whole classroom of identities that need to be protected. And so, you know, maybe you don't think that that cybersecurity matters, but, but it matters, you know, and this is like life-saving stuff when we start to get into the reality of it. Cause oftentimes in cybersecurity, we market and talk about like, you know, we kind of focus on unrealistic cybersecurity things like someone's going to jump out of a helicopter and, and, and parachute and, and hack you from above your office while parachuting. You know, I don't right. know, like people will get into this, like these crazy scenarios that are never going to happen. What's going to happen and does happen is, you know, you have someone who works with a bunch of people that people target. And it happens in education. It happens in, in other spaces. It happens all around the world in all kinds of different types of industries uh, where people are, you know, identified as like targets or vulnerable. And we got to keep our generation safe because, you know, some people don't have the best self, the best interest in mind for, for, you know, young folks and, and future generations. So we got to keep them safe. All this stuff matters uh, is how I see it. 
Yeah, absolutely. And to the manufacturers of this machinery, you know, the Hondas or the second in line to put this tech into their product. My question to you is, how do we get that message across to them without a catastrophe happening? I think it really comes down to putting responsibility on leadership and then just just really emphasizing on responsibility and leadership. Because with the Internet, we've seen this huge spike in, uh, well, just like influence. And the, and the term influencer now exists and, and people will be like, yeah. I'm an influencer. They're an influencer. That person's an influencer. And like this, this term exists because generally speaking, just the way people work bandwagons exist for a reason if we're just going to be blunt. And so if bandwagons exist for a reason, then, you know, if leaders don't believe in security and if leaders don't think that certain things are going to put their business in jeopardy and things like that, I think one thing that we can do to get leaders to have more interest in security is talking about how security genuinely impacts your day to day and how not caring about the safety of your team then this is maybe for some people, they, they care more about their bottom line than their people. And for better or for worse, whether or not people like it, you work in the corporate space long enough, you'll find there's a lot of people who could care less about their people and just care about the bottom line. And so talking about how the, a negative impact to your people impacts your bottom line, maybe the most. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and people don't talk about that because why, why does turnover exist? Turnover exists from generally em- employees feeling like they they don't have some purpose out of place, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's like the highest level way to explain like what what causes high turnover. If people feel like they matter or they feel like they enjoy the people that they're around, people do work they hate even. So it's not even a matter of people doing work that they hate or working in industry you hate. If you talk to enough people or you train enough people or help enough people get jobs, you'll hear this one phrase that people say often uh, when they get into, say, like an industry or something along those lines and say like, well, maybe that's just not the industry for me or maybe that's just not the job for me. And I think maybe in order for society to think more about safety and others a little more is. If you have a really good manager, people don't say that they they might say, well, maybe I don't like the industry and things like that. But then uh, if someone goes from a, an industry they don't like and they change industries they're going to inevitably come up with the same complaints that you heard. And so I've, I've had people who I've worked with where I've helped them get multiple jobs and, you know, lo and behold, it's just like a broken record. Uh, they'll be like, well, maybe I'll go change industries. They go change industries and they're like, Oh, but I, I'm miserable. No, like the exact same identical language will come out uh, that they said at another company. But then let's say that they get to a company that they like and you, you really get into it and you just listen to them rant. Then all of a sudden their language will change and they'll be like, my manager said that I did something good. Someone gave me credit today. I just got this thing from my employer. They said that they appreciate me. And all of a sudden, like the, the, the way that they talk about work changes and maybe it wasn't an industry that they thought that they hated or doing something that they thought they despised doing. Really, in a lot of ways, when, when people are taken care of, it, it, it attracts more people too, which attracts more customers, which attracts more business, which attracts more money. So I feel like maybe we should talk about that because people who don't necessarily care about security, at least hopefully care about money. So if we can at least talk about that, that's something that I've been thinking about. (laughs) For for those who are just like, (laughs) who cares about those other people? It's like, no, it's a culture of positivity. And if you align to that culture, then I believe the output will be positive. You know, your employees will harness that positive energy. So I'm going to flip the script for a second and talk about people developing machines that mimic people. So I'm referring to deep fakes, deep fake video, deep fake audio, text to speech models are starting to emerge. It's crazy. And when you look at it from the perspective of cyber war, man versus machine, I personally think that the biggest battle is really yet to come or maybe we're already in it. You know, I've thought about that a lot, too, because what happens when AI gets sophisticated enough? Because there's there's a concern out there that people think about now. And that one makes sense, which is like, oh, well, people could try to impersonate people. And a a weird thing about that is identity becomes blurred when you can copy and paste a person practically. And, And, you know, when we talk about. People trying to say so-and-so said this and so-and-so said that 
that becomes, you know, it's already a tricky thing, but then all of a sudden when you, when you can be like, well, listen to this or, or, or watch this. And then, you know, we get into the context of like deep fakes and framing and, and things like that. Uh, I think another danger that comes with that is what happens when there comes a day when you create some form of like AI that's, you know, impersonating someone else or something along those lines. But what happens when the AI decides to impersonate people on its own for its with with some form of goal that we might not understand? Because, you know, if, if it's if it's AI, it's going to come up with whatever it's going. It's going to do whatever it's going to do and contextualize what it's going to contextualize. But what happens when we start having AIs that are purposefully trying to to imitate and mock people? Because I do think that that's going to be something else that we're going to run into at some point in the next decade, maybe not today, but you know, we watched like the new star Wars movies and whatnot. And you see uh, the, the characters CGI'd on top mm-hmm. to where it's like, it looks, it looks like them. It looks like the actor. And, and you know, then it also gets into another territory where people like to have this weird thing of like ownership and what they own and what they don't own. And the internet kind of makes the concept of ownership infinitely more complex too, because then when we get into the concept of like deep fakes, and then we have a large global enterprise business who's taking people's faces and putting it in movies when they're not even around anymore to say anything about their opinion on this whole thing. You know, it it then comes down to those with power can also kind of start to give themselves, you know, be like, well, this was okay. So maybe I should try this too. And, And then what happens when, when people start wanting to like own people's identities, because this is another one that I've been thinking about too, because businesses already are like half crazy with some of the NDAs. If you really read them out there where I, I've had companies where it's like, you're signing it and they're like, we own all of your ideas while you work at our entity. And I won't say who's NDA. I won't work for these people ever again. Uh, yeah. But it's like, you can't actually enforce things like that, but people love to try. And then when you give people alleys where they're like, well, I own this person's face and, and and their ideas and I own this stuff from them anyways, like they try to say in some of these things. Mm-hmm. Well, then what's to say that if they feel that that's true and, and, and their lawyers are able to defend that, that say corporations can't even just take who you are. And then, and then, and then now you're running a company, but it's not you. You're mm-hmm. not running that. Like we think about like famous Abe's cookies or there's some brand, I think it was famous Abe's cookies where someone made their face part of the brand or something like that. And then basically like some legal ruling said that, that they can't use their face for a brand anymore because it's owned by this other, I think it's famous Abe's cookies or whatever famous. Abe's. You know, I think whatever. I heard that too. Yeah. 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 So like what happens when they, when they're just like, well, the person's gone, but we can just put them in the commercial anyways. You know, what, mm. what does that mean? Because that's today. And, and, and while maybe I'm the one who will give someone the first idea to go out there and, and do something outrageous like that, shame on you. If you do that, don't do that. But anyways, the reality is someone out there is going to think that that is a good idea somehow and that that somehow makes sense. And, and, and that's something that concerns me. <laughs> It's scary. It it really is scary to see this actually unravel in front of us. It is. It's it's uh it's it's definitely strange times, and it's and it's a little unsettling. Uh, people worry about all these other things, but if you want to worry about some that now, that's something to worry about. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Let's just say to help suppress that concern, you decided to develop a new cocktail. What would be in it? So if I had to develop a cocktail, it would have gin and grapefruit juice and cranberry juice and, and a, and a splash of tonic water. Nice. Would that go through uh, QA or would you feel confident enough to just put that straight into production? Oh, like a uh, QA for blue mirror or for <laughs> no QA for, uh, for the bar. Cause oh. if you need like some type of beta <laughs> tester, I'll come up and uh, and I'll test that drink out for you. Oh, I mean, I'm amazing. I'm good for that. You know, we could try different variants. We could we could try replacing it with some some uh, replace the the grapefruit juice maybe with some lemonade. See if that's better. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Now you're uh, you're located in Frederick, Colorado. Is that I uh, yeah. I, well, I, I'm in uh, in that in the Boulder County area. That's right. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
Are there, uh, are, are bars open or opening up out there yet? There are a few. Uh, and then there's, there's a few outdoor ones that are, they're pretty nice. I, you know, I haven't, I haven't really been able to just like go out and just enjoy a <laughs> drink. Like well, you're, you you're home to. coding and you got to come to the barcode cause you can come and drink it barcode and code. It's true. I'll just go out there and just, just work on stuff. People know where to find me. <laughs> any, any uh, like cool speakeasies or, or secret bars out there that you know of and can disclose how to get into? Oh, there's one that B sides goes to a lot. If so, um, if, if there's B sides Boulder and whatever bar that they seem to go to often, I always am just like, oh yeah, let's just go to B sides. And then I just started calling the location B sides. So I actually don't even know where it's located that like, <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's that secret. Yeah. It's, it's just like that. So, uh, that's a great place. And there are some great people down there running that, uh, some people are weird about shout outs. Some people are not weird about shout outs, but, but I'll just say shout outs to the B sides people. Cause they know who they are. Uh, and there's some neat people to, to go hang out with if you want to go. And, and they're just out there sometimes. Um, some neat places down in, uh, I guess in the area I'm in now, I just, for some reason I, I know where places are and I just, I don't know what they're actually called. Cause that's just, that's just what I do. I'm like, I'll just go to that one place. I'll tag besides Boulder. So, uh, they can, yeah. they can steer us in the right direction. They they have all the best spots. So if you, nice. if you want to know the places to go. There is a place right next to where secure set Denver is called the tavern. Uh, that's, that's a pretty, a pretty easy spot to just like jump into if everyone's like just down in the area and just wants to like meet up somewhere real quick. Uh, it's not my favorite bar, but in terms of like accessible, it's right next to Coors field. It's, uh, it's just an easy place to congregate at the tavern. So that's another place. Nice. So I just overheard last call here. Do you have time for one more? Yeah, I can do one more. Cool. If you opened a cybersecurity themed bar, what would the name be? And what would your signature drink be called? I owned a signature cybersecurity theme. The name would be. Maybe I, maybe I just call it DevSec bar. (laughs) (laughs) And then maybe. That's awesome. Maybe the drink will be the dev sex shock. Dev sex shock. <laughs> yeah. Would you survive that drink after you consumed it? Maybe I'll give it like various options so that you can like okay. turn up the heat. And so maybe the, the, the base version is just, you know, the drink that I described earlier, but then you could add hot sauce to it and, and just see how, how much you can, you can handle. And then that would be real, maybe like some, some ghost pepper, hot sauce, something real spicy. It'll just be a real interesting experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got to sign. You got to sign a waiver. To, That's to right. You're like, how, how how hard are you going with it? Are, is is this going to be a shocking one, or, or are you trying to just keep you know minimum shock? <laughs> <laughs> you can play on the commit, right? You you have to commit to uh, not suing us. <laughs> That's right. You're okay. like, if if you start tearing and your lips are burning, you know, you- <laughs> not liable. <laughs> yep. Not liable. That's right. Uh, uh, now you have a, a huge online footprint. Just give us a quick rundown on where our listeners can tap into the, uh, the awesome content that you're creating. So I do so much that what I decided to do was just straight up centralize my brand over NATO as code, which is my YouTube channel. Uh, and then the other way to follow me is just like my LinkedIn, which I generally just kind of go back and forth between LinkedIn and YouTube. If you're trying to learn more about business and you're trying to learn how to connect with folks and all that stuff, LinkedIn all day long. And if you're trying to learn, you're trying to figure out like, how does the industry work? What's it like to work in certain types of roles? You know, what's going on with, you know, what should you learn? Why should you learn these things? Can you skip the entry level? You can, but what does that mean? Would it be pleasant? You know, so all those sorts of things, how to start a cybersecurity job, then YouTube all day long. So. Perfect. Well, Nato, thank you again for joining me today and and sharing your perspective and insight. You know, I, I wish you much continued success. Thank you. Barcode patrons, if you enjoyed this episode and want an easy way to support the podcast, please leave me a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. If you're not on a Mac or iPhone, just visit the barcodepodcast.com slash reviews. I appreciate all the support. Cheers. 
Unfortunately, it's time to shut the bar down for this episode. Thanks for stopping in. See you next time. We'll save you a seat. Be sure to check us out at thebarcodepodcast.com.